20 the last class right so let's see if you have any doubts from there um i know we have been having classes quite regularly quite frequently now so it might not be possible to keep up with the pace but in case still if we, if we had the chance to uh, go through the material or through some questions if you have any doubts or such anything i don't have any as of now okay in that case let's continue with uh supervisory reserves and capitals so we got done with chapter 19 last class we will continue with chapter 20. i'll just bring up my screen let me no one is visible. Just a second. Yeah, is screen visible. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, so we'll continue with uh, the last. Uh, like the theme of the last chapter where we're talking about supervisory reserves and capital. Uh, so we all uh, discussed extensively last class about how different regulations uh, use a mix of reserves and capital uh, solvency capital requirements in order to uh, determine the total amount of assets that a company should hold uh, to, to back their liabilities, uh, in particular insurance companies. Now, like we'll again touch base upon that topic uh, in this chapter but to start off with it let's just consider the broad assumption sets that we were discussing in the previous class so if we if we uh, look back at it we we were mainly talking about the uh, best estimate and reserving set in the last class right uh, uh, talking that the reserving set uh, is uh, like is a more prudent assumption set as compared to the best estimate set and the best estimate set is something which is which does not have any inbuilt prudency. It just pro, uh, projects what is most likely to happen in the future. So there are 50% chances that that particular thing that uh, like we have set as an assumption, the best estimate assumptions will happen and 50% chances that that particular thing would not take place. So we have a 50-50% chance of the best estimate assumptions occurring and not occurring. That is what a best estimate set of assumptions, also something that we'll refer to as a market consistent set of assumptions in this chapter. Now, uh, one more reserving set, uh, one more not reserving set as such, but a assumption set that we did not talk about extensively last class was a pricing set. The pricing assumption set is basically uh, the set of assumptions uh, on which the company undertook its pricing exercise. What do I mean by undertook its pricing exercise? It means uh, like the set of assumptions the company used in order to set its premiums. So uh, while developing the product, while designing the product, or uh, uh, at follow-up pricing activities, the set of assumptions that, a, that an insurance company used to decide its premiums is what we call as a pricing set of assumptions. Now, it's written that a pricing set of assumptions is prudent as compared to the best estimate set of assumptions. Why do you think so that would be the case? Why would a pricing set of assumptions would generally be more prudent as compared to the uh, best estimate set of assumptions. Why do you think that's the case? Um, is it because of the unpredictability that we have about the future and we need to make sure that we set aside enough reserves to ensure that we can pay claims and generate profit at the same time? Yeah, so uh, about there, so pricing set is basically used to set your premiums, right? So the main concern while setting your premiums is whether you will be able to generate enough profit in your business or not. Like, uh, uh, like at the end of the day, when your uh, a tranche of contracts is complete, you should be able to generate enough profits out of it. So your major concern is whether your premiums is padded enough for all your expenses that will occur in the future, be it claim expenses, be it other expenses, commissions, all kind of expenses should get taken care of by the premiums you will receive, as well as you should be able to make some profit out of the entire exercise. Uh, so that's why your pricing set of assumptions are generally more prudent in order to ensure that certain profits arise out of it, right? So 
you either like there can be various ways of doing so either uh, in your demographic assumptions itself such as mortality or uh, lapses assumptions such as these you you include a pad you you uh, like shock those assumptions that you use in best estimate to derive your pricing assumptions instead of doing that what other what most of the companies do these days is they use the same set of assumptions that is used in best estimate so you don't have any difference in the set of assumptions like not a lot of changes between the set of assumptions between pricing and best estimate um on the other hand what is different between the two assumption sets is that you have a this different risk discount rate so the, the interest rate that you're using to discount uh, in these two uh, assumption sets is different so what do you think whether the pricing like if you want to have a prudent set of assumptions would you set a higher interest rate or a lower interest rate student set of assumptions but have a lower interest rate or a higher rate of interest rate everything else being equal what would be the effect on interest rate um no lower yeah because lower interest rate will lead to a higher value of liabilities mm -hmm. so uh your liabilities will get discounted less and generally the duration of liabilities is lower so liabilities are generally occurring in the initial portion of your contract and less discounting of it would mean uh higher liability and generally that is the reason why a, a prudent assumption basis have a lower interest rate so the general norm in pricing is to use a risk the risk free discount rate or a discount rate that's generally lower than your best estimate basis and maybe set your assumptions to be the same as the best estimate basis or what's the other way you can use all assumptions to be more prudent be it your demographic assumptions be it your expense assumptions everything can be set to a more prudent level now that's the three assumption basis that we are talking about the best estimate pricing and reserving set like if i talk about each of them stand alone is the concept of these three basis clear the purpose and uh, like why are they used and uh what what are the kind of assumptions they have is that clear is there in doubt there cool uh is there is there no doubts uh um, the last part of this particular thing why 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 are we talking about these three assumptions sets is uh the point that at times the reserving set can be the same as the pricing set as well now we know we, we studied about it in the last class that in certain legislations you have cases where the reserving set is equal to the best estimate um, assumption set and you have stricter solvency capital requirements right and in some legislations you uh, you might have uh, a, a padded up uh, reserving assumption set assumption basis so you have certain prudent assumptions being used and your know, solvency capital requirements are slightly less uh stringent so here because we are we know that the pricing set of assumptions has uh, have already been set as a prudent set of assumptions so uh, what companies do in order to like uh, avoid using a, a new assumption set altogether in order to like simplify their modeling exercise so as to say uh, they use the pricing set as a reserving set so because the pricing set already has uh, already has certain has certain pads built into it they'll use that as a reserving set to be used for uh, uh to be used for calculating reserves as well but again this can be very subjective because uh, like we are, we have assumed that the pricing set of assumptions is already prudent uh, we assume that the prudency set into the pricing assumptions is enough for setting reserves enough for the regulator as as, as advised by the regulator to uh, to, to set up reserves so a number of ifs and buts are here but yeah in certain companies you'd see that pricing assumptions are also being used for calculating reserves uh that being said it largely depends on what the regulator says if the regulator wants a more uh, padded set of assumptions you'd have to go with that if the regulator like in your opinion union wants you to use the best estimate set of assumptions you'll have to do that so it all depends on the regulator but the entire point of discussing these three assumptions is for that um in certain markets where the regulator is not very stringent about 
what kind of reserve, reserving uh, assumptions you want to use. Uh, you can have a reserving set that's the same as the pricing set as well because the pricing set already has some prudency built in. Make sense? Any doubts? Is this clear? I'll pause for. Um so yeah. for best estimate it would be uh different from the reserve like uh we can have the reserving and the uh pricing set to be equal but earlier yeah. that we were discussing uh in the uh, yesterday's class so best mm -hmm. estimate can also be uh, put as a basis when calculating yeah. the reserves and maybe that could mm -hmm. include the reserving uh right. basically the right. prudence in it no it then it won't have prudency uh like we discussed in uh last class that in certain legislations like in a and z you do not need to have mm -hmm. any prudency set into your reserving set. You can have the reserving set as equal to the best estimate set, and then you have stricter soup SCRs. The solvency capital requirements can be more stringent. So it all okay, depends so on how the regulation is working. Okay, okay. So I was confused that uh, whether the best estimate includes a prudency or not. But yeah, okay, no. got it now. The best estimate is just what is most likely to occur in the future, so it has no prudency. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pricing set. Is slightly prudent to make sure that profits are arising in the future to make to like uh, to take in care about the uh, like various uncertainties about uh, different factors. So you need to 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 be ordered to be sure that you'll be making profits to set certain pads into the pricing set. When it comes to the reserving set, it all depends on how the regulator has asked you to do it. If they are happy with the best estimate, go ahead with best estimate. If if they are happy with the uh, like if they are Less less stringent as such as to say, yeah, they might allow the you to use the pricing set itself because it had some prudency built in, or else they might have their own set of assumptions that you would have to use. Okay, maybe got hundred and ten percent of the industry tables, hundred and twenty five percent of the industry tables. So it all depends on your regulator. Okay, any yeah. other thing? Oh. No, thank you. Cool. Uh, Okay, that's about this then. Uh, now, a significant portion of this chapter is focused on uh, like how how do you do valuations with a market consistent. So you have a uh, like entire topic as to what market consistent valuations mean. But before delving into that, what we'll do is we'll study about just two approaches, just uh, like two approaches as such: the passive approach and the active approach of valuation. So all valuation approaches of liabilities as well as assets can be broadly divided into two approaches. One is passive approach, and the other is an active approach. Now, what is a passive approach? Passive approach, as the name suggests, is one uh, where you are uh, you are not changing your assumptions a lot. So your assumption basis uh, is broadly uh, broadly constant over the years. Um, the and your whatever valuation you are doing, be it for assets or liabilities. Is largely insensitive to your market condition. For example, if you say inflation or your rate of interest are going up and down in the market, your assets and liabilities are, however, largely insensitive to those changes. The assumptions that you are using, uh, the assumption basis is not updated frequently. Uh, so most of the times, what happens is your assumption basis might be locked in. Uh, so what say you had a big assumption exercise in your industry or in your company say ten years back. Uh, where you determine a set of assumptions to be used across valuations, and that uh, set of assumptions has been continued to be used uh, for all future policies that have been sold. So most of the times, your assumptions have unlocked it. Um, what can be updated? Generally, the assumptions that are updated in these sets are the economic set of assumptions. What do I mean by the economic set of assumptions? The rate of inflation, the rate of interest rates. Those are the ones which are generally. Uh, updated because you'd have to uh, like take care of what your assets are earning, right? Uh, your liabilities are backed by assets, and generally, what you discount your liabilities by by whatever rate of return you expect to earn on those assets which are backing those liabilities. So, as your inflation rates and interest rates are going up and down in the economy, you would your asset rate of returns will go up and down, and you would thus thus uh, change the uh, interest rate which is used to. Discount your liabilities. Hence, just the economic assumptions might be uh, changed in the entire set of basis. Uh, so that's about the passive approach of 
uh, valuations where it's not really changing a lot of basis is not changing one passive valuation approach that was uh, that has been for long used in the life insurance business is the us gap basis uh, which is in fact being discontinued now the us gap basis was the one where you had a locked in set of assumptions that were you getting used so what are assumptions whatever assumptions were were defined right, right at the time of uh, pricing were generally used in your uh, uh, like us gap assumptions and then ldi came in where you were able to use your best estimate assumptions and maybe uh, like update them a bit from time to time okay and as far as valuation of assets go under passive approaches uh, you have uh, generally assets being taken on the book value so whatever the asset has been bought on that minus amortization on depreciation till date is generally uh, assumed to be the value of asset so that again is insensitive to your market changes or your assumption changes as such uh, and and hence it the entire job of valuation becomes a lot simpler a lot easier a uh, lot less subjective you do not have to interpret of lot of interpret a lot of things that are uh, market variable as such and uh, your profit generation is also very smooth so why why do you think the profit generation will be smooth under the passive valuation approach any ideas there why do you think that the passive valuation approach will lead to lead to smoothening of your profits uh the basic reason would be not updating assumptions too frequently so yeah, not, um yeah if you don't update your frequency uh, like uh, assumptions a lot frequently your your reserves are not going up and down very frequently right and what is your profit or loss in a in a insurance company it's basically the change of reserves from one year to the other if your reserves or valuation of your liabilities is value of your liabilities is not varying a lot it's it's staying uh, like not as to say constant but the like the decline or the increase is smooth then a lot of things uh, like then your emergence of profits will also be smooth it will not uh, be haywire in one year it's too high and in one year it's too low that wouldn't be the case right make sense yeah. any doubts there no no uh so active valuation approach is basically quite uh the reverse of that so you have a valuation approach where uh like you are updating your assumption basis from time to time uh you your your like your reserves are broadly like very very frequently being updated uh and your reserves are uh, like very sensitive to any market changes that are occurring as well so everything is very sensitive and your reserves might go up and down a lot so like quite contrary to the passive valuation approach as we discussed till now uh, everything's not very certain in a manner and one uh, one thing that we'll study about extensively in this chapter that we skipped for now was a market consistent valuation that is what is an active approach for valuation a active valuation approach where you are constantly uh, looking into what is uh, most probable to happen in the future and you are updating your assumption basis accordingly uh, uh, so your results are more volatile uh, your your profits go up and down a lot uh, your emergence of profits might not be as smooth as a passive valuation approach but generally what's the case uh, is that neither you have an extreme of the passive valuation approach nor do you have a extreme of the active valuation approach uh, companies somewhere lie in the middle where 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 they use a combination of active and valuation active and passive valuation approach for uh, like uh, valuing their liabilities and assets okay any doubts sir any doubts
ऑल गुड ऑल गुड कैन वी गोइंग टू द नेक्स्ट पार्ट या या ओके सो द नेक्स्ट पार्ट इज वेरी talk about uh the uh the like market consistent value of a uh, a consistent valuation of liabilities so we'll mainly focus on liabilities here like how do we conduct a market consistent valuation approach so like the name su- suggest you will try to find uh what market value you can sell the particular asset or liability for and try to value it at that particular value so if i were to value a particular asset asset in a market consistent valuation i will try to see at what value at what value can i sell that particular asset in the free market right now for and that becomes a market consistent valuation of that particular asset okay uh, similarly for liabilities if i were to uh, like find a market consistent value for that i would see uh, like what how, how like what is the value i can fetch for it right now so what is the value i would have to pay for it to sell that particular liability and that would become the market consistent valuation of that particular liability however most of the times a market does not exist for most of the liabilities uh, especially for an insurance company because the liabilities are packaged products such as uh, like annuity business or term insurance business or endowment business so a ready market for these assets and liabilities is not available so it becomes very difficult not like uh like impossible but yeah a difficult task as such to be able to value such liabilities uh so what does the company do uh like it would project all the cash flows and parameters uh, according to its best estimates and then take a uh, risk free discount rate to uh, calculate the present value and that would become the market consistent valuation of those liabilities the so broad concept clear like what is market consistent val- valuation where you are coming from what's the idea yes yeah so here we talked about uh, sorry guys just give me a second sorry guys yeah so i was talking about market consistent valuation of liabilities and we discussed about discounting a cash flow that is risk free rate of return now um, generally what insurance companies do is like like we were discussing right now we should discount our liabilities at a rate of interest rate uh, which we are earning on assets used to back those liabilities right so if uh, my liability in the future is to pay a claim amount of 100 and i'm holding corporate bonds corporate bonds to uh, be able to pay off that liability in the future i should be using the expected rate of return on those corporate bonds to discount those liabilities right is this concept clear that my uh, expected rate of return on assets should be used as a discount rate to uh, discount my liabilities cash flow stream of liabilities is that clear any doubts yep. no uh so but here we also read that the market consistent valuation says a risk free discount rate so a risk free discount rate is much more prudent it would overstate your liabilities on because your corporate yields are higher so you would if you if you are discounted at a higher rate of interest your liabilities would be lower on the other hand if you are using a risk free rate which would be lower your liability valuation of liability should become much higher right so what do you think is the difference between the risk free rate 
and the rate of return on a corporate bond like why is the difference why is there a difference between two why is there a difference between the risk free rate which is generally the rate on a government bond and the rate offered by a corporate bond um is it because of the risk involved say so in the risk free way we are assuming that everything's perfect and so yeah. there's no risk yeah. whereas with the corporate bond yeah. we are seeing all sort of risk like the liquidity risk the marketability sure. risk every other risk there are so the interest at the rate that will be offered would be much higher so right. like so, yeah. yeah so you generally have the marketability risk and the credit default risk right most of your risk or or your illiquidity risk what's the illiquidity or the marketability liquidity and the marketability risk that when you would want to sell the bond say the corporate bond then the market might not be deep enough that you can get a suitable price for it right and the credit default risk obviously comes in that like the uh, corporate uh, association does not like uh, does not uh, uh, pay 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 off uh, pay off its liabilities and the default occurs on the bond uh, so these are the two major risks that exist uh, so the difference between your risk free rate and your corporate bond yield rate is basically based on two premiums one is the illiquidity premium and one is the credit default premium right the default risk premium and the illiquidity premium so if, uh, say the risk free rate is 4% and your um, corporate bond yield rate is 6% then i can say i have a 1% illiquidity premium and a 1% a uh, credit default premium so the the reason the uh, bond holder is uh, earning an extra 2% worth of yield is because it's taking uh, 1% worth of illiquidity risk and 1% worth of uh, credit default risk does this make sense any doubt there no doubt there yeah yeah now so if this is clear then what our companies allowed in the market consistent valuation is instead of using the risk free rate use a rate of interest to mark to discount your liabilities which takes into consideration the illiquidity premium but not the credit default like the default risk premium okay so instead of using 4% or 6% to discount my liabilities i'll be able to use 4 plus 1% which is 5% to uh, to discount my future liability cash flows and get a lower liability a lower reserve okay a lower value for my liabilities why do you think that would be the case why would some jurisdictions under some conditions allow you to take advantage of the illiquidity premium and why would the illiquidity premium be some be something which the uh, which which a regulator would say okay you can add this to the risk free rate and then discount your liability and you can have a lower amount for your liability why would that be the case any ideas there maybe to reduce the yeah sorry you go ahead go ahead yeah so uh, maybe in order to reduce the prudency in the calculation maybe so that the reserves are uh, less prudent mm, but why like why 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 would they be comfortable with that the end goal of a regulator is to protect the interests of consumer um yeah. is it because the corporate companies can then use that um extra uh the 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 uh, or these like the opportunity cost rather than putting that cost there they can use that cost to maybe come up with a better product so the regulator might be okay with that not exactly Like think from the point of view of just discounting and valuing these liabilities, like uh, okay, uh, so most of the time, like why why does the liquidity premium exist in the first place? Because if you want to sell the asset before maturity, uh, it might be so that the market value is lower or uh, higher, and you might not get the desired rate of return, right? that's the liquidity premium that is in the case of a distressed sale like sale of the asset before its maturity 
at maturity, you know, you would get this value from uh, the corporate owner. But in the case of a sale before maturity, the price is uncertain, right? The price you would get in the market. Yeah. So because of yeah. that uncertainty, you are getting that illiquidity premium. Now, what if uh, the bondholder or the insurance company is holding this asset to maturity no matter what? It knows that I'll be holding these corporate bonds till the end of, uh, like, till, it's, till, it, till it matures. If it's a 20-year bond, I'm going to hold this bond for 20 years no matter what. My other... Uh, residual cash flows can be met by something else. Can be met by some other asset. So in that case, I, I, I'm no longer worried about the marketability risk or the liquidity risk because that would in no condition affect me because I would be anyways holding this particular asset till its maturity. Does this make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, why, so are why, we saying they, would hold, they wouldn't care about the liquidity because some people will hold it till maturity? Yeah, because they'll be holding, like the insurers will be holding it till maturity. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So they would, anyways, not be concerned about whether, uh, like, the, or, of a distress sale of the price they would be able to fetch if they would have had to sell that bond before the maturity. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. in that case, what the regulator tells us, I know you are holding assets in maturity. So why don't you add this illiquidity premium to your risk free rate? I don't want you to unnecessarily hold a higher reserve, uh, although you are holding long term assets till the maturity. So you can go ahead and add a additional rate, uh, interest rate to your risk free rate, which is the illiquidity premium. And you can use that particular rate to discount your liabilities to get a lower value of your liabilities. Now, does it make sense? About yeah. like the entire logic of uh, having a, so yeah. by increasing the discounted for valuing the uh, liability, they are actually uh, reducing its present value. Um, Correct. That Correct. that's something going on. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So instead of using a risk-free rate, you are using risk-free rate plus the liquidity premium because you're backing your liabilities with assets, which will hold to maturity. So that's the reason most of the jurisdictions have a lot of, again, conditions in place. Uh, like when can you add this illiquidity premium to your risk-free rate in order to discount your liabilities? And most of the cases, it's when you're holding really long-term liabilities. Um, which you'll hold till maturity. If you're not holding your asset till maturity or if you have plans to sell the asset before, then you might not be at this, you not, might not be able to add this liquidity premium to your risk period. All good, makes sense? Yeah. Uh, so the next part of market consistent valuation is, uh, a risk margin. Now, like uh, here, we were talking about most of the cash flows uh, in an insurance business, such as cash flows payable on death or cash flows uh, say payable on survival. So these are these are these are events for which markets do not really exist, right? So it might not be very uh, like whatever estimates you are making of uh, these cash flows in the future are. Are, have a element of uncertainty attached to it. So you're not very sure that these will be the exact cash flows that will take place in the future. So you want to ha uh, like add certain risk margins uh, 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 to the to these uh, cash flows in order to like in order to take account of the uncertainty at uncertainty attached to these cash flow elements. So how do you do that? Is basically first your starting point is your best estimate assumptions. You use your best estimate assumptions to project all your future cash flows. Uh, and then you add a risk margin to each of these cash flows. So the first way of adding a risk margin to your cash flows is uh, like shocking your assumptions. Something we read about in the uh, 
रिजर्विंग अजम्पन सेट और अ प्राइसिंग अजम्पन सेट दैट यू कैन शॉक योर से मोर्टैलिटी अजम्पन बाय टेन परसेंट हंड्रेड एंड टेन परसेंट शॉक योर लैप्स अजम्पन बाय ट्वेंटी फाइव परसेंट एंड देन प्रोजेक्ट योर कैश फ्लो कैश फ्लो एंड दैट इज अ रिस्क मार्जिन दैट यू हैव एडेड टू ईच सेट ऑफ अजम्पन राइट टू कॉम्पेंसेट फॉर द अनसर्टेनिटी यू आर टेकिंग बाय सेलिंग सच अ प्रोडक्ट and that becomes the cash flow that you will then discount to uh, like to calculate your um, market consistent value of liabilities right that is one way is this way clear do we have have any doubts here any doubts on like no, no doubts okay now no. the next method is is slightly uh, more more typical in a sense Uh, which is called a cost of capital approach. Now, in a cost of capital approach, uh, the first step of uh, adopting, uh, like, like deriving the cost of capital in a sense, is to project all your required reserves in the future. So, you'll project what is the required reserve at each point of time. Now, you can do this using the reserving set of bases that you already have. You have a reserving set, uh, like, and you will. Uh, Use that reserving set to calculate what is the policy reserve that needs to be set up for a particular particular tranche of policies at every point of time in the future. Okay. Once you have the amount of reserve that you need to set in, like hold at each point of time, you will multiply each of these amounts amount of reserve by a certain rate of interest rate, which is called the cost of capital. Now, what is the cost of capital? Now, again, the cost of capital. uh in rate is like very subjective you can uh, have a like number of uh, like ways of deriving it but the best way of thinking about it is like if you were not using this particular money which you are setting aside for as a reserve now what could have been a better use of it what and what could have been the next best use of it right uh, like what what happens with money which is set aside as reserves in companies um they have to be invested in uh extremely risk free assets so you would be earning just a risk free rate of return out of them but what if um they were they were they were not invested in this risk free asset what if you were not selling this insurance policies what if you did not have to set up this uh reserve so instead of that what w- would have been the next best alternative you had where you could have earned a certain uh uh rate of in, uh, rate of return so it Take that rate of return, subtract the risk-free rate of interest rate from from that, and that becomes your cost of capital of, of investing it in this particular business, of setting the uh, setting reserves for this particular policy. So you'll uh, multiply each of those required reserves at future point in time with this cost of capital interest rate that we've calculated. Is this is that clear? first we project the required capital each point of time and then we multiply that by the cost of capital what is your cost of capital cost of capital is nothing but the next best alternative or the opportunity cost of investing it here of investing it to set up these reserves and we uh, subtract the risk free rate of return because the reserves are generally invested in uh, extremely risk free assets so once we do that we get the cost of capital rate of return so we multiply each required reserve by the cost of capital and we get a certain amount at each point of time in the future now once we have that we discount that using the market discount market consistent discount rates what is the market consistent discount rate risk free rate adjusted for liquidity premiums if any now what you get now discounted basically becomes your risk margin uh sorry uh the market consistent discounted was the risk free rate adjusted for what in liquidity premium when okay. the entire price that you are adding the liquidity premium back to our risk free rate so that is the cost of capital approach you calculate the required reserve at each point of time so using the reserving set that we have already put in place then you multiply that by a cost of capital rate interest rate at each point of time and then finally discount that using a 
risk free rate like the market consistent discount rate which is the risk free rate plus the liquidity premium if any which we discussed so do we make assumption about the cost of capital rate um in the for every point in time in the future or does, um, does is it the same rate that we assume in the future or does does it change for every year it can in fact change for every year so you can have a term dependent uh, cost of capital Okay. 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 Yeah. So, like again, you would think you would see that this approach is much more complex as uh, compared to like just spiking your assumptions and decalculating your reserves. But it all depends on uh, like. what is easier for the uh like company to do at times it's e- even easier for the company to perform this because this occurs on what how should i put it a group level right you already have the reserve that you need at every point of time in the future and you just have to like discount it and multiply by rate of return you can simply do it in a excel model but when it comes to uh, spiking your assumptions and then running your projections itself that might involve running actuarial models and uh, might involve a lot of time and cost so it all depends on what capabilities a particular company has has what is easier for them to run and what the regulator is happy with um, so uh, like if all three boxes are ticked they can go with anything which is most comfortable for for them in in some jurisdictions in some regulations it can be as simple as just multiply your reserves by a certain percentage If you are holding hundred reserves right now, add another ten percent. That becomes your risk margin, and that's your market consistent valuation of liabilities. But again, uh, it is it is uh, very subjective. It differs a lot from a regulator to other. It differs a lot from one company to other within a particular uh, regulation within a particular jurisdiction. Hence, it also becomes important to check what valuation basis companies using companies are using when you are comparing balance sheets of different companies. because uh, like companies that are using different uh, valuation basis might have uh, like might 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 portray the same thing on the books but the real financial health of the companies might differ a lot from each other yeah any doubts here about, about risk margin all good Cool. Um, the last part of the chapter is about solvency capital requirements. Now uh, we discussed briefly uh, about this in the last class. Like, what are solvency capital requirements? So, solvency capital requirements is basically uh, the insurer is required to set up this over and above the uh, regulatory reserves in order to make sure that they are able to meet the future claims as and when they arise, even in the adverse situations. So. there might be a number of ways of calculating this so we'll focus more on how we can calculate this in this particular chapter in the last class what we discussed was how the reserves and scr interplay with each other that there can be jurisdictions where your regulatory reserves might be high scr is more simple uh, like uh, less stringent and in some regulations you have just a best estimate set of reserves like uh, use the best estimate assumptions get your reserves calculated but you have a more uh, complex way of calculating your solvency capital requirements which is generally more stringent right any doubts uh just a quick question on that but where you mentioned that we are adding up the scr over and above the best estimate so um as you highlighted earlier as well but the best estimate assumption is something that is looking into the future of the company and that's why it's not including the prudence in it right right yeah okay yeah so the prudency can be built into your reserves into like the, the, the so what is the um final motive of a regulator the motive of your regulator is if your present value of liability is 100 rupees you should some how hold at least 160 worth of assets okay 100 160 now now it can ask you to set your reserves at just 110 and solvency capital requirement 
an ex extra 50, bring it up to 160. It can ask you to set your reserves at 150 and solvency capital requirements of another 10 to bring it up to 160. It can ask you to set your reserves at just 100. Keep, like keep your reserves just at what your best estimate reserves are, which is, which is 100, and bring up your total uh, uh, capital requirement to 160 by a 60 of solvency capital requirement. So it can be like it it differs a lot. There there are regulations which exist that do both of the both stuff. So it's very difficult to comment on what each might be doing. Yeah, but yeah, uh, like you have regulations where both the extremes also exist and a mix of both also exists. Okay, uh, but not every time uh, the insurance company faces the uncertain events like the extreme events. So, uh, would the company release SCR in any time to the free asset or like uh, it holds it every time whenever doing the reserve calculation? So, generally, like companies would have a like try to keep a level business, right? Like, uh, whatever business is going off the books, you try to sell at least that much amount of new business. Right, that would be the motive of a company. So it see that most of these reserves stay constant over time. In a sense, if if the amount of new business that they are selling is not greater than the amount of uh, business that going off the books, so generally you would see that the SCR is going up, the total amount of assets is going up. But yeah, you might have situations where the SCR is uh, like getting released. Becoming free capital for the company, basically, basically assets which are up, over and above the SCR. Okay. Yeah. Cool. If that is clear, uh, then let's move to how we calculate uh, this particular solvency capital requirement. Now, again, there can be various ways of calculating the solvency capital requirement. You have an uh, entire regime set in place in European Union called the Solvency II uh, uh, regime where you have a uh, specific, like, specific way of calculating the solvency capital requirement. Uh, we won't, like, we don't have solvency two in our syllabus in particular. I think that is one in the SA subject, SA2, but, uh, but we'll briefly discuss on what and how can the VAR approach be used for calculating a solvency capital requirement, which is basically the value at risk approach. So what is the value at risk approach? Um, it's a statistical method in general, where you are deciding first a confidence level and a time horizon. So you are saying the 99.5% confidence interval and one year time period. So you are basically saying no matter what, I should be able to beat my all my liabilities. I should not go insolvent for 99.5% of the times in the next one year. And we'll try to hold assets such that you are able to meet that confidence level. So we'll maybe generate many simulations of what can happen in the future, which in this case is your time horizon of one year, and then try to hold assets in which you would not go insolvent for 99.5% of the times. So if we generate say a million simulations, 99.5% of a million, you will try to be solvent for 995, 100,000 times, 995,000 times. So you'll have like uh, total liabilities in this uh, for, for, for each of those 1 million simulations. We'll try to hold assets for staying solvent in 995,000 uh, number of those simulations. Now, how do you do that? Um, now, to, to calculate your value at risk approach, how do you generate these simulations in a sense is a company has a long list of shocks. What do I mean by shocks? Shocks that can be applied on uh, the assumptions it has basically used uh, to calculate its uh, balance sheet. Okay. Uh, now, what are these uh, shocks or stress tests as we call it? Um, like, um, you can assume that the market, uh, like, market becomes unstable or there's a recession in the economy in the current year. So what will happen? Your lapse rates will go up. Your uh, interest rates will go down. Um, there can be cases where your mortality rates even go higher. Uh, your inflation uh, like goes up. So there can be various 
uh, shocks to the like assumptions you used while uh, valuing your uh, particular liability. So all of those assumptions will be uh, imposed uh, to such sort of such stresses, to such shocks, and the uh, and the liabilities will be calculated in each of those stress tests. And then we'll see uh, that you should be able to have enough assets to meet uh, those liabilities in the coming one year for ninety nine point five percent of those things. Yeah, but one should also keep in mind that most of these uh, like stress or most of these uh, factors are complementary to each other. Complementary to each other in the sense that they might occur jointly in many circumstances, and they have a element of diverse uh, diversification in certain situations as well. So you must consider the correlation that exists between various uh, risks as such. And then apply stress or shock to such risk, and then calculate uh, the future value of liabilities in order to get an accurate value for your valued risk approach. Does this make sense? Next, like how do you, do we go about the value at risk approach? So the key thing is. Basically, deciding your confidence level and your time horizon, and the next thing then is to decide a core like what risk factors do you want to shock, uh, what is the percentage that you want to shock, and what is the value, what what is the correlation matrix in general that you want to use for the various risks. So you'd be able to like generate as many simulations as you need, and then uh, decide on a level of asset that would be enough to protect you for the Confidence you have chosen, say at ninety nine percent, ninety nine point five percent of the times in the uh, coming one year. All good. Does this make sense? Yes. Can you give an example of the correlation matrix, please? A correlation matrix is basically like uh, so, like you were talking about when an economy is in recession, uh, mm -hmm. you would have higher lapse rates, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you might have two situations where you're increasing your lapse rate. Uh, like so, these are uh, isolated shocks. One shock is you are one simulation is where you're just increasing your lapse rate. The other mm -hmm. is when you're just say uh, like reducing your interest rates. Okay. okay, these are two isolated incidents. But yeah. what happens in general is when an economy goes into uh, a recession, uh, your 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 lapse rates will also go up. Yeah. Because people collapsing out on policies, and the government would reduce your interest rates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. your rate of return on investment also go down, and people lapse out more on your policies. So you should be able. There's a certain amount of correlation that exists between these two risks, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you should also model a scenario where both of these things are happening together instead of in isolation. Okay. So it's just like how the lapse rate and the interest rate will happen together. So say if, like you said, if if we go into the recession, the lapse rates will go up and the interest rate will go down. Likewise, yeah. because these two are somehow correlated with the recession, we right. we come up with a situation like that. Okay. Yeah. In this way, you'd have you'd have certain data about all of these rates in the past, and you okay. could derive a certain degree of correlation that exists between each of these factors, risk factors, yeah. and yeah. Like the correlation as well uh, mm -hmm. to 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 estimate the future simulations. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the final approach, like apart from the VAR approach, uh, you have something called a runoff approach as well. What is the runoff approach? Runoff approach is uh, like a, a more crude way of calculating this. Uh, it's basically you you calculate the amount of capital. Uh, that you need at a very inception, like at a very start of selling out of your uh, policy, so that you can cover the liabilities till the last policy goes out of your books. So you will keep stressing your risk factors. So the point of stressing your risk factors still uh, still continues, but you are no longer assuming say a time horizon or uh, a confidence level. You are just saying I need to be able to meet all the liabilities. 
till the very last policy goes off my hook. So you don't have a confidence level, you don't have a uh, time horizon. You just want to hold as much as possible to make sure you are never going out insolvent till the last policy is out, out, out of your books. Yeah. Make sense? Any doubts there? Yeah. That's about this. Uh, I'll have to just check whether these are all the chapters we have in booklet two as well. If that's the case, uh, you all can start with booklet two. Yeah, I think we have covered all the chapters of booklet two. We have covered asset shares. We have covered chapter six and seven with profit distribution. We have covered the general business environment as well as supervisory reserves. So you have everything that's there in booklet one and two. Booklet one, there's one chapter related to unit pricing that's remaining. We'll, we'll get to that maybe like uh, after we get done with booklet three because unit pricing again is something uh, that is uh, like that's broadly very mathematical, very, very uh, monotonous in a sense. So you'd uh, readily uh, recognize those questions in your first booklet as well. Uh, but booklet three, booklet four would be like something that's more conceptually demanding. So we'll maybe focus on these two booklets uh, in the next few weekends and then continue with uh, uh, get back to unit pricing. Okay. Um, so I think we can close the class for today. Uh, there's just one more thing. Although I think we are on track for getting done with our syllabus by somewhere in the middle of February, still I wanted to have some buffer. Uh, do you guys uh, would be okay? Like, do you have any leaves on Monday, the first of Jan? Like, we would have classes on Saturday and Sunday. Would you both have any leaves on first Jan? Yeah, okay. I have. Yeah. Yeah. Would you be comfortable in having a class as well on that day? Yeah, yeah. Somewhere in the afternoon, say two p.m. to three p.m. The time we have it on Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, then maybe I'll try to set something up and have a chat with Vanshika whether we can have it, and mm -hmm. we will have something on first as well. Cool then. Uh, okay. Let's see you on Saturday for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.